to you. Um, thank you. First, I want to thank the committee for the invitation. It's a pleasure and an honor. Um, the question is, making inoperable pancreatic cancer operable, is it worth the toxicity? So the question is, is it worth the toxicity? Uh, on a semantic point of view, uh, inoperable is quite different than unresectable. It's quite different, but we speak about resectability. Locally advanced, truly locally advanced, few secondary resection, I think 10%, about 10%. Borderline is quite different, and the definition should be surgery must be technically possible at the time of initial staging, but the surgery carries a high risk of R1 or R2 resection. So, induction therapy seems to be logic, with the expected dropout, almost for progression of the disease, and you can hope to be uh, to have a, a patient co becoming resected. The problem in the literature is very often borderline and truly, truly locally advanced cancer are mixed in the, in the papers, and it's, it's a difficult problem. The toxicity. First, the toxicity, and then we move to is it worse? The toxicity, it's a long clinical pathway for the patient, including stenting of the biliary tract, induction therapy, treatment disruption, interventional radiology if needed, surgery-related toxicity, I mean post-operative morbidity and mortality, at 90 days and not at 30 days, inability to receive post-op chemo, and this is almost 30% of the patient, worsening the quality of life, and the first is biliary stenting. Uh, biliary decompression with a stent and tissue diagnosis are required prior to treat the patient. And usually is one step procedure with the US FNA, but about 20 to 30 percent of the patient had a second procedure to obtain proven pancreatic cancer. Uh, other point is biliary drainage also lower non-specific CR99 amounts, allowing a more reliable estimate of the disease. Biliary stenting, this is well known, favors post-operative infection. Second point, short metal stents are required because the early experience with plastic stents show that at least one stent exchange was necessary in 75% of the patients, and this is time and irradiation, those related in the experience of the MDA. About 15% of the patient had cholangitis, and cholangitis, in most of the experience, represent half of the readmissions of the patient. Second, the toxicity of induction treatment. And I talk mostly about fulfirinox, fulfirinox without radio, uh, and then radiotherapy or both. What are we reading in the recent literature? We, are, we read that this is acceptable, manageable, and for the most part, reversible. However, readmissions rate is near 30%. Due to stenting toxicity, treatment toxicity, disease-related toxicity, need of dose reduction in quite most of the patients, disruption of the treatment in 5 to 10% of the patients. Third, toxicity of surgery. Some studies have suggested a significant increase, but this is a case based analysis from the Memorial uh, Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, and you can see here that there is no statistical difference in overall postoperative complication, major complication, that means clavian 3 and 4, pancreatic leak fistula, mortality is the same, and this is another series from the US, recently published with a large amount of patients, 
Preoperative biliary stentin, as expected, is significantly more in the group of neoadjuvant therapy, vascular resection. Ex this is expected, more vascular resection. And if you look to the 30-day mortality and morbidity rates, there, there was no significant difference. I, I want to give you shortly my experience. In the 15 years uh, later, we do 900 pancreatic resection. We have 130 pancreatic borderline or locally advanced resection according to the NCCN uh, criteria. We have now, for the last five years, a mortality of pancreatic audionectomy of 1%. In borderline and unresectable, initially unresectable patient, because we push the limit, we have a 6% postoperative mortality at 90 days. And sometimes the mortality is due to very late complication occurring after the first month. This is a very important point to my, to my view. I try to answer, answer to the second point of the talk, is it worth the toxicity? Preoperatively, three major points, a decline in performance status, failure to recover from treatment related toxicity, evolving medical comorbidities, disease progression seen on the restaging is a powerful predictor of poor outcome and I think these patients are almost metastatic patients. Second point, CT scan remains the gold standard. However, response after neoadjuvant therapy is very difficult to appreciate. And the response is quite not reflected by radiographic indicators. I put here an anatomical view with the SMR margin here. And this is a patient. And Matthew Katz show about a large US survey that in 75% of the patient, there is an overestimation of the SMR margin on the CT scan after neoadjuvant therapy. We work now on MRI, and uh, we have an ongoing uh, work about the low ADC in the MRI with diffusion after neoadjuvant treatment, and this would be interesting for the future. The third point is the clinical value of pain relief and removal of analgesics, because I think that a patient with a dorsal pain is not a good candidate for secondary surgery. And the biological value of the decrease or normalization of C99, this is very classic, suggesting a treatment response. So, how to appreciate the world worse? The RO resection rate, the number of patients with PN0 disease, the histopathological response, and we must have a pathological report with the grade, overall and disease-free survival plus quality of life. We have in the literature, recent literature, eight papers from 2012 to 2016. Uh, I, I want to say to uh, Marcus Bechler that the only paper with truly locally advanced cancer is the paper of Nietzsche and from the group of Heidelberg and Munich. All the seven other papers mixed uh, unresectable, truly locally advanced, and borderline cancer. And this is very difficult for the interpretation of the results. And we have three meta-analyses, and in the three meta-analyses is the same problem. The patients are mixed. So the resection rate is about 30%. The histopathological response is about 30%. And complete response is quite rare, less than 5%. Survival, 20, 20, 24 months, with a median PFS of 12 to 17 months. In this paper, it's clear that 
we have some patients with very early metastatic recurrences. I, I choose this paper because it's very easy to remember. 100 patients, and all the percentages are very easy because it's 100 patients in the initial of the, of the study. Restaging at three months, metastatic, response, 15 percent, 63, stable disease, coming to radiotherapy. Restaging at nine months in median, once again, 25 percent response and resection, 63 percent stable disease, and five patients, distant progression. Finally, in the memorial experience, mixing borderline and locally advanced cancer, we have a resectability rate of 30%. So, I think that in such patients, the answer to is it worse is yes, probably. This is a paper we, we published recently. We, uh, I include uh, many patients in this study, and it's about the pathologic major response, taking into account only resected patients, 80. As you can see once again, 47 borderline, 33 locally advanced, 65% at the combination of chemo and radiochemo, the mortality was 2.5, morbidity 22%, and L0 rate 40, uh, 84%. I want to come back very shortly about the R0 rate because it depends on the standardization of the pathological protocol after the surgery. And this is the survival curve, as you can see, YP T0, TN in zero had a very good survival instead of T2, T4, N0, or N+, plus, this is the curve here. Pathologic major response was, was observed in 26% of the patient with a good odd ratio, 0.3, and this is a major pronostic factor for this patient. I, I want to, to go now to some pending issues, and probably it's useful for the questionnaire tomorrow morning. Three points, resectability. The way forward for me is, have, have, uh, we, we have to move probably with a rest, to a restrictive definition. What is the best regimen and the best sequencing, and how to predict the response to induction? Uh, everybody here knows the, the problem of the definition. And MD Anderson Cancer Center, the NCCN, the, consens the American consensus, there is also an European consensus, the Alliance trial, CATS published this in the ASCO in 2015, the Intergroup. I, I want to show you this. This is the, an anatomical view of the superior mesenteric vein and the portal vein, superior mesenteric artery, and this is the SMA margin. Everybody knows that over 180 degrees, the problem is not the vein, is not a technical problem. The problem is the invasion of the fat and the surrounding tissue of the SMA. This means 2 3 of Ishikawa, PV1 of Nakao, and this is 4 of Ishikawa and PV2 of Nakao. This is um, an anatomical preparation I do in the labo, and you can see the proximity of the TC and the superior mesenteric artery. And the surgery today of pancreatic cancer is this part of the dissection. This is the major part of the R1 resection. Um, raising this question, is upfront synchronous venous resection today still justified? This is very debatable because technically it's feasible, expert centers, mortality, morbidity, survival equal, systematic reviews and meta-analysis, conflicting results. The group of Philadelphia published 
in uh, 2010 a very interesting paper. This is surgery upfront, and this is after neoadjuvant therapy for 2, 3, and PV1 stage of mesenterico-portal vein suspicion of invasion. And this is for 4 and 5. As you can see, no benefit in this group. This is our experience. We published recently in Annals of Surgical Oncology. You can see it's a large retrospective. It's retrospective, but it's a large survey from experience centers in France. And you can see that thunder resection versus venous resection is different, with a little benefit for neoadjuvant therapy with venous resection combined with neoadjuvant. And this is the most important result for me. In RON0 patients, the survival curves of venous resection is worse than the standard resection. This is the recent meta-analysis of the BGS. Non-curative resection favors by venous resection and five-year overall survival. As you can see here, the plot is on the right, and venous resection carries, in most of the series, a worse prognostic. Uh, I, I want to do a reflection about this. In multi-experience centers, like us, we have 110 portal vein resection. The survival in our center is the same. However, it's 100 patients. When you take into account 1,000 patients, the results are, are, quite dif are quite different because the, the difference in median survival is sometimes relatively high, but not significant. And we said it's the same in terms of mortality, morbidity, okay, but survival is the same. So the rising question is, have we to move to three Ishikawa to borderline and not to upfront surgery? So the, the conclusion of this uh, topic is any suspicion of venous involvement of the CT, 20% to 40% rate of negative vents, inflammatory, the results published monocentric studies with equivalent morbid mortality and survival, and I think probably that the benefit of neoadjuvant strategy, particularly with chemo and fulfirinox, may overweight the risk of over-treated the patient. Uh, I, I want to do just some word about arteries. You can see here that in the NCCN guidelines, they include this point, very important point. Variation of arterial anatomy is to be considered before resection. And this may include the patient in the borderline situation. We have sometimes an encased right hepatic artery. Should we preserve and block resect with reconstruction, neoadjuvant treatment? We published uh, with the group of uh, Case Lillemo our experience of right hepatic artery, and this was not significant, but there is a difference between no right hepatic artery and right hepatic artery, probably because in some patients, the interface between the tumor for preservation of the right hepatic artery is, uh, is uh, um, I'm sorry, it's our, our, our own resection because we open the interface between the tumor and the artery. This is uh, an accessory right hepatic artery during pancreatic to me. This is the modal right hepatic artery, the superior pancreatic odiodinal artery, after a first uh, SMA approach. This is a, a typical field of radiation. Sometimes it's different than the not irradiated patient, with a total liver inflow by the replaced right hepatic artery. And the question is, probably today, it's useful to require a preoperative embolization of the right hepatic artery 
to do an unblock resection. This is a patient with a right hepatic artery. This is the angiography. You see the stent here. And this is the result of the coils. Eight days after the embolization, the right liver is revascularized by the left hepatic artery. And this is very interesting because, sorry, this is very interesting because there is some case reports. We have five patients like this, and today we have no morbidity related to this procedure. For the celiac trunk, the problem is the gastroduodenal artery. This is a problem with the abutment to the celiac trunk. Here is the same. The gastroduodenal artery is free. And we can proceed to an embolization of the celiac trunk, leaving the place to clamping. These are the coils. The distance from the aorta to the coils, and this is very important to put a clamp and reject. And you see here the liver blood flow via the gastroduodenal artery, the revascularis. And the patient had a resection, an RO resection with a resection of the celiac trunk. You have here the division of the common hepatic artery, and this is the major point is the gastroduodenal artery. This is the IVC the SMA, the left renal vein. Je vais passer là-dessus. I want to finish. I have just two slides about the margin of resection. I hope be not too long, but it's very important. This is an operative view with the SMA, the first genital artery, the, the pancreatic audiodenal arteries, and this is the specimen. The surgeon had a major role in the pathological staging after the resection. This paper, recently published by the MD, is the margin of resection after neoadjuvant treatment. And you can see here that the one millimeter, which is extrapolated from rectal cancer, probably is not enough for pancreatic cancer, because the survival curves move higher when, when you look at the distance. This is inferior to one millimeter, the traditional zero millimeter. This is one to five, and this is five millimeters. And you see that the survival and the PFS moving higher with the distance to the tumor. Considering N plus R1 remains significant, considering the lymph node ratio, R1 is not significant. Uh, this is my last slide. The problem is the prediction of the response. And we have, uh, with, in my institution, um, a laboratory of research. And we have uh, a program of clinical transfer. And I want to show you just, I am not an expert, <laughs> it's complicated for me, but I want to show you this. The blue and the red. This is a blind study. We take a short specimen during the FNA or during the surgery. And in a blind study, we compare the results, moving to the clinical data after the genomic study. And the problem is, it's, I think it's a good illustration of pancreatic cancer. In this survival curve, there is borderline and locally advanced cancer, secondary resected. And in this curve, there were patients with truly resectable cancer. Thank you very much. <laughs>